Our first and Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 through 10, which can be found on page 663 in the Old Testament section of your Pew Bibles. Page 663. Listen for the word. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. And then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of the jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor it shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be on their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The New Testament lesson today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 2 through 11, which can be found on page 11 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. Listen again for the word. When John heard in prison that the Messiah, what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, are you the one who is come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The word of the Lord. Friends, let us turn to God in prayer. Come to us during this Advent season with your power, O oh God. Open our blind eyes that 
we may see what you are doing in our world. Open our closed ears that we may hear the cries of the poor. Come to us with your power, O oh God. Transform us, change us, and make all things new. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Last week, during worship, we encountered the great John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, where Matthew, where Matthew, where John the Baptist is preaching out in the wilderness. Um, and if you want to open your Bible to Matthew just to check that I'm not making any of this up, uh, feel free. So this last week we were in Matthew chapter 3 where John is out preaching in the wilderness, inviting people to repent and turn away from the kingdom of Rome and other kingdoms of the world and inviting them to live according to the kingdom of heaven. This week, in the text that John just read from Matthew 11, we learn right at the start that John the Baptist is in prison. God's people end up in jail a lot in the Bible, and we should probably take that as a word of caution that if you get caught serving and advocating the kingdom of heaven in our world, there is at least a chance that you will find yourself on the wrong side of the empire. A couple of chapters after our reading this morning, in Matthew chapter 14, we will learn that the reason John the Baptist is in prison is because he had the nerve to tell King Herod that Herod could not just take his brother Philip's wife. Kings typically don't like to be told no, and John specialized in telling kings no. So we remember that last week in Matthew chapter 3, John was preaching a rather abrasive and aggressive message of judgment and of fire. The axe, and you, you have to really say it like that, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water, John said, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. He's talking there about Jesus as the Messiah. And his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff, the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So that John the Baptist is not exactly Mr. Rogers in a cardigan sweater. Now, in our text in Matthew 11, John's in prison, and he sends his disciples to Jesus to ask a question. And that question is, so are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? John had given his life to preparing the way for the one who would come and save Israel. John's vocation in life was to be the herald, was to be the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who would usher in the kingdom of God. Now Jesus has come, and John is wondering whether Jesus is really the one. Now, the text does not tell us exactly why John was unsure about Jesus here, but it seems to me somewhere between possible and likely that the reason John was suddenly unsure is that Jesus is not conforming, Jesus' ministry is not conforming to John's expectations of what the Messiah would do. John's disciples, a couple of chapters before our reading this morning, had come to Jesus and had challenged him 
For not being as serious and earnest as they were, John's disciples are fasting a lot. While Jesus is always going to these parties and he's eating and drinking a lot and he's hanging out with sinners and it's all very, very bad. And so John's disciples are upset about this. They had also heard Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew preaching about loving your enemies and about how God makes the sun to rise and set on both the evil and the good, and that didn't seem to them a whole lot like fire and judgment. And so it seems at least possible, maybe likely, that John was troubled that Jesus was not taking a hard enough approach to their enemies. And so John sends his disciples from prison, John's still thinking about this in jail, sends his disciples to Jesus to find out if Jesus is the real deal. Well, in response, as is Jesus' habit, he does not give a straight answer to a question. You rarely get Jesus giving a straight answer to questions. Instead, so Jesus does not say to the disciples, yep, I'm the Messiah, go back and tell John. Nor does he say, nope, you got the wrong guy. Instead, Jesus sends the disciples back to John and tell John what you've been saying. And then Jesus allows John to reorganize his own expectations about what the Messiah would be. And Jesus' response to John here is almost straight out of Isaiah chapter 35. Tell John what you're seeing. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf can hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. New life happens everywhere Jesus goes. Jesus walks into your life and brings new possibility to situations that seemed closed and that we're at a dead end. Jesus walks into the life of a community and breaks open closed families and closed congregations and closed organizations and Jesus sets people free from whatever form of bondage and captivity they are in. Jesus seems to be saying, go and tell John these are the kinds of things that are happening if John has read Isaiah 35, because you've got to do Bible study, if John has read Isaiah 35, he will know that this is the advent of God. And then Jesus has this final little line there in that little paragraph that is a pretty curious final line. Jesus says, blessed are those who take no offense at me. Right? That's kind of an odd thing to say. And it's odd and curious for several reasons. First of all, this line of Jesus is there at the end about blessed are those who don't take offense at me suggests that Jesus expects that there are going to be people who are going to be offended by him. And for those of us who spend our lives trying to be so careful not to offend anybody... That's probably enough of a teaching right there. You could stop the sermon right there and that would be enough. Some of us go to extraordinary lengths to try. We bend over backwards, contort ourselves, trying to keep others happy. As though in Exodus 20, the first and really the only commandment were, Thou shalt please other people. But Jesus was not very bothered about keeping people happy. That in itself is a big curious point. But more and probably more important than that, we may ask just who would be offended by Jesus doing things like this? What is so offensive about giving sight to the blind, healing lepers, raising the dead, preaching good news to the poor? I mean, 
you can see why people might be offended by John the Baptist. He's all, rah! You can see why people, that's, that's actually what John the Baptist would have been like. You can see why people would be offended by John the Baptist, but Jesus? And so as I've been thinking about this, sitting with this question of Jesus offending people, I think that there are two groups of people who would be offended by these deeds of Jesus. See if this squares with your way of reading the narrative, and then we can talk. So one person or group who would be offended by Jesus doing these things are those like John the Baptist who may have wanted him to be doing other things. It appears that John was among those who expected the Messiah to come with fire and force and destroy the enemies of Israel. But now, the one who claims to be the Messiah is focusing his time, energy, and attention on healing, feeding, and bringing good news for all people. John, I would submit, is offended because he was disappointed. It is always a temptation to want Jesus to be aligned with our ideology, our party, our nation over against our opponents. And if that's what we're looking for in Jesus, someone who will line up with the way we think, then we are going to be disappointed. The second group who would be offended by Jesus raising the dead and bringing good news to the poor are those who need the dead to stay dead and who need the poor to stay poor. For years, whenever I read this text, I thought that the only sharp edge in this text was between John and Jesus. It was a contrast, I thought, between Jesus, who did nice things, Jesus, who was nice and did nice things, and John the Baptist, who was mean and scary and talked about fire a lot. So I thought that that's what this text was about. I had forgotten that the gospel is not about being nice. The gospel is about the reign of God over the powers of death. And empires do not execute nice people. Any understanding of Jesus must come to terms with the fact that he was executed. Jesus was crucified, executed, and not for being nice. Jesus was killed because his actions and his words offended those who were in power and it showed that he was a threat to their systems and so they had to take him out. During the season of Advent, we await the coming of Jesus. And when Jesus comes to us, he comes with the power and the love of God. And according to the text, the power and the love of God are good news for the poor. They are good news for those who are trapped. Good news for those who long to be released, long to be healed, to be set free from their captivity that takes a variety of shapes and forms. And of course, when we put it like that, what that means is that the good news is for all of us. For there is no distinction, the Apostle Paul says, all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all of us, broken, wounded, trapped people, trapped in different ways out of our own personal histories, and we are all yearning in the, from the bottom of our lives, we are yearning for the light 
and the freedom of the kingdom of God. And the news of these texts, these two this morning, and from the beginning of the Bible to the end, the news of the text is that the kingdom of God is at hand. And so you and I are summoned to turn away from the kingdoms of the world and to live our lives according to the kingdom of God. Now, according to the text, when we do that, some will be offended by that. So we should be prepared for that, but that's okay because the good news is for all of us. To God and to God alone be all of the glory. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Speak your liberating word into our lives, Lord. You know the ways that each of us is trapped. You know the different kinds of ways that we are captive. Different ones of us are captive to different things. But the news of your word is that we are all in some form of bondage. And so, dear God, dear God, we pray that you would speak your word that liberates down into our lives and then we pray for a mustard seed size of trust and faith and courage, willingness to trust your word, and then to step forth and live our lives on the basis of your word rather than on the basis of our many fears. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.